this free trial for FSD that has been announced that's start be rolling out to uh, all US capable cars sometime this weekend, which it looks like it's already started rolling out. How do you read that move? Do you think it's a data collecting move where they're trying to maybe get this in the hands of folks that perhaps don't even know this thing exists and they're trying to get it out there so people can actually maybe you know Tesla can gather more data from that from that release or do you view it as Tesla has reached a point where it's a legitimate use case for full self-driving to be in the hands of every person and by doing that you'll also get better like how do you think this is a signal uh, of Tesla's progress I guess I don't think a it's data collection okay no reasons because they can do data collection on any of the cars that are out there now. sorry Hans they did don't... you want to did you want to say something I assume I was just gonna before you answer the question i'd like to add one extra piece of context and it's just this is the way that i've been thinking about um the take rate for fsd essentially for tesla for a long time um was that it was low because they wanted it to be low that they were using the 12 or fifteen thousand dollar price point or the 200 dollars a month thing because those were essentially prohibitive measures that they were constraining the amount of beta testers that they wanted because everything else that they were working on was a bigger problem for them at the time than the data that they were using and that they didn't want to expose the system to additional safety risk by having users that didn't have sufficient skin in the game being allowed access into the beta essentially and i when i realized that i basically it it became clear to me that eventually they would pass the safety threshold and the maturity threshold in the performance, um, both in safety and in comfort. And that was another element that Elon spoke about, not only be safer than a human, but also behave like a human so that when people experience the system, that it was a pleasant experience for them. So it's like, I knew once they solved those problems that then they would be willing to give a free trial out because it switches instead of trying to keep people out of the beta, now you want to actually bring more and more people into it. And so it, it seemed to me like that was um, basically just an indication of the stage of maturity in the system. And so I'm curious if, you know, is that a correct way to view Tesla's strategy in who they, you know, allow into beta versus not, or how they're doing their pricing? And, and what does that mean moving forward? Like, how could we see pricing or take rate change moving forward if that is true? Okay, so on the topic of whether they were intentionally limiting the population of people, I don't have a good feel for that. It's, it is probably true that, it, it's certainly true there's a certain minimum population of people you would like to have in there in order to make rapid progress, okay. Is there an upper bound to the number that are useful and is there a downside to having more than that. I could imagine that there might be, but I don't have any good reasons to believe that 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 there's downside there. I don't have good reasons to, I don't know that there's not downside there. I just don't have a good, like I can't off the top of my head, I can't think of a good reason why there would be, aside from liability. Like if you don't trust it, you might wanna minimize the pool, but you can deal with that by stage rollouts, which we do see them do, right? Um, and you know, they have an obvious incentive to like include people, which is they get paid for FSD, which is high margin revenue when, when it comes out. So there's that countervailing thing, like is what reason would rise to the threshold of being willing to give up that revenue? I, you know, I have this other sort of way of, of like, I'll toss a couple other thoughts out here, right? That might be worth thinking about. But the take rate is something. They have 400,000 people that use it. Um, but when you, you know, if you look at the number of miles that get driven on FSD and you calculate the total number of cars being driven by all the car, miles driven by all the cars, only 10% of the miles or less than 10% of the miles are getting used on FSD, right? So my experience with talking to people is that you get 90% of the people who almost never use it and you got 10% of people who just like use it all the time, right? So you have this minority of people they've gotten over the hump or they're naturally comfortable with it or whatever the deal is, they find it, accept, you know, and they use it a lot. But <laughs> you got this huge chunk of people where it it's not acceptable to them and they got it and they're waiting for the real thing to be delivered that they can actually use day to day, 
Like that's been my sense for a while is one of the big failures of the point of the, of the program up to now is that of the people who buy it, very few people use it, right? Like 10% of people are using it. 90% of people pay for it. And you can imagine you pay $12,000 for this thing. And you feel like you can't use it. You're waiting and waiting and waiting. That's not a good customer experience. So now V12 rolls out and you, they look at, in fact, what the metric I'm most interested in of the numbers that we might get from Tesla over the next couple of quarters is those V12 miles. You know, we've been watching it go up. Well, I did the, you know, I've been watching this thing go and essentially it's tracked the number of cars that were in the program over time. So, you know, we've gone from 10 to 11 or whatever the deal is, but people really on 11, they weren't putting a lot more miles on it than they were putting on 12, some more, right? But it was mostly just scaling with the number of cars that they had let into the program. Remember for a long time, there was a safety score thing and they weren't rolling it to everybody. And then eventually they did and that kind of stuff. But if you looked at the numbers, the utilization wasn't really going up on a per car kind of basis. If we see the utilization go up a lot on the per car, like that's a great metric because it suggests that they've crossed that threshold. If we, if they get to where 80% of people are using it, you know, that has sent the company a really important and valuable signal that they're going in the right direction as far as getting a product that satisfies the people who buy it. So like, that's a thing that is in the back of my head. Like there could be this dynamic going on. It seems to me, just me looking at the thing, like I am I use it for 99% of my driving. Like it's crazy. It's when I was on 11, I would go month and I wouldn't drive my car, right? Because the FSD just drove every mile everywhere that I went. But my, it's really clear that that's not the experience most people were having. Most of the people that I know, they had certain situations they would use it and every other situation they absolutely wouldn't use it. And, and that's not where you want to be. That's a, that's an indicator that your product isn't working. You're not satisfying the needs of the customers that are getting for the people who are buying it because they want it in their car to drive them around as opposed to, and robo taxi is a whole nother thing that you have to do, but there's a pretty good chance that if you can't make the people <laughs> who bought, bought it on their car happy, you know, feel like using it after they spent $10,000 on it. It, it's probably a good sign that people aren't going to get in your robo tax either, right? Because you're going to have a lot of people who just, you know, they're not comfortable riding around in it, given the behavior it has. So I'm really excited and interested to see this number. And that will be an interesting number to watch progress too. I expect, given what I've heard, the feedback I've seen on, you know, YouTube and Twitter and that kind of stuff, I expect that number to tick up. Exactly how much it ticks up is going to be a really interesting number. And then if it continues to tick up, like if we see the utilization go from 10% to 30, 40, 50, and continue to get better with successive versions, like we'll have learned something really important about how the, how the progress of product is making. Um, so like I see that kind of dynamic in the background too, that like uh, Tesla has this problem they need an answer to. And they may be really excited by the prospect that V12, you know, will solve this problem that they've been dealing with. The problem that what they've been doing isn't good enough for the majority of their customers, right? And then, so that, of course, you know, that eventually turns into take rate. And people like to talk about take rates because a lot of the chat about the company is about the stock price, right? But I'm much more interested in the utilization rate. Like, I think that's a more important indicator than, than the take rate. I think if your utilization rate is there, the take rate will follow. Like that problem will solve itself. And more importantly, like, you know, and getting back to the pricing on the FSD thing, the other thing that you brought, I think Tesla thought they were going to solve this a long time ago. Like, I don't think Elon was blowing smoke when he said two weeks or next year or whatever. I think he believed that. And that all along, the path. Like I saw good reasons why you could credibly believe that stuff. Right. And I was inclined to trust his instincts on this, him having the information we didn't get there. Right. But imagine that as far as the pricing goes all along this, you want to be pricing it with the anticipation that like two years from now, you're going to be pushing robo taxi, right? Okay. What does the robo taxi business model look like? They've talked about the Tesla network. So there's this, this idea that people who have Teslas could put them on the network. Right. And so there's a revenue share thing that happens with that, you know, Tesla, you know, you lend your car out, it drives some miles, Tesla takes a cut of that. The owner gets the rest. You know, there's a rate that you charge the customer. There's a cost of operating the vehicle. And the difference between that is like profit that Tesla splits with owners. Like this was like a concept for a business model. This is what they originally talked about. Other, everything they've said since then, which has been relatively little, has been consistent with this original idea. So maybe this is still the idea that they have. They've also talked about 
having Tesla owned vehicles, right? I mean, Elon has talked about them in the context of like, if, you know, Tesla owners don't put enough vehicles on the thing, we can supplement them with our own vehicles. You know, we know that they're working on a vehicle, not going to have pedals. They call it the robo taxi, right? It was in the Isaacson biography. Elon's mentioned it a couple of times. And, uh, you know, so we have all of this information that says that the, uh, that the forthcoming low cost $25,000 vehicle is also going to double as a robo taxi. Presumably there will be a version without pedals and stuff like that. So Tesla will have the capability to build it. So there's that other, the other business model is Tesla builds wholly owned fleets. Right. Those are, and those two, these two can be mixed, right? You can have both of these things going. Okay. Now, so a customer who buys a Tesla, who gets FSD on it, they basically, they pay for FSD and then they get a car that will drive them around as much as they want. Like that's the, the FSD thing. It's not a license. If you get a subscription, it's a subscription and that's different. But for the people who bought it, they paid for it. What should that thing be worth? Well, if you run the numbers and I've run these numbers like 50 different ways, right? The net present value of a Tesla that's got RoboTaxi function on it, it's like a couple hundred thousand dollars, right? It's very easy to get to that. Now, it's a moving thing, it's a moving target. If what it is 20 years from now, 10 years from now, five years from now, those are all different numbers, right? But at the peak, there's a point in this process, you know, it, uh, when the RoboTaxi thing starts, initially, it's, it's competing in a rideshare market, right? Rideshare prices are set by humans who drive rideshare, mostly in urban areas in the United States. And, you know, the stats on that are really well known. We know what people pay. We know how many miles they drive. We know what the demand curve looks like on that because there's tons and tons of rideshare data that you can look at. Um, as long when you're in that rideshare envelope, basically the cars are making bank, <laughs> right? Because you're not paying the driver. The cost of operating the car is 46 cents a mile. You know, the average rate for for miles, the mile rate, the average trip in the in the US is like four dollars a mile, but the average mile is two fifty because there's a long tail and you look at the statistical distribution. So the average car drives fifty thousand miles a year. Like I I I pulled the Chicago, you know, public rideshare data recently and I built a fleet model for Tesla's running on that. So, you know, it takes ten thousand take takes ten thousand robo taxis to satisfy the current demand. They drive an average of 55,000 miles, including deadhead miles, including deadhead overhead. It's 46 cents a mile operating and you're making 250 a mile, right? So every single one of those cars, you know, if you've got 10,000 vehicles, each one of them is clearing $100,000 a year, okay? What's the net present value of a vehicle that generates $100,000 a year in profit? It's a lot of money, <laughs> right? It's a big, big number. Okay, getting back to the question. So what do we charge people for the privilege of participating in this, right? And I think if you suggest $5,000 is a good number, like, you know, I think Elon was setting the expectation that his thinking at the beginning was, this is going to be a $50,000 option eventually. And we're going to ease people into this idea that you can participate in the Tesla network and you make good money on it, but there's this upfront payment and then we take a cut down the road. And they had a pricing idea that they were getting into. And when it was $15,000 and now there's $12,000, that was on the way to where they thought that entry thing. Now you can do the business a different way. You can charge nothing for FSD. You can give it to people for free if they, for the miles that the car uses on the robo taxi thing, and you just take a bigger cut, right? Maybe Tesla takes 50% instead of, they mentioned 30% as a, as a cut rate. Incidentally, that $100,000 per car per, that's satisfying current urban demand in the United States, which can suck up about a million vehicles, right? 10,000 for Chicago. Chicago is almost exactly 1% of the US urban population. That's 80% of the population, 265 million versus 333 million, 330 million people in the United States. So that's a million taxis making $100,000 a year at the point that you get to a million taxis. Right now, if you want to grow the market beyond that, uh, also, you know, if there's that kind of money being made, there's no way that no competitors show up, right? Like everybody and their brother is going to be trying to get in on this on this uh, money machine, right? So the so prices will come down, and they'll come down in response to how fast the you know competitors come in. Now maybe competitors will come in as fast as they're making self landing rockets, right? And, and maybe, so maybe there's a 10 year window when nobody competes with Tesla, right? Or maybe, because the thing is, it's, 
It's a hundred billion dollars of profit at, at the point where you've got a million taxis, you're still in the rideshare zone and the taxis, you know, they have the kind of margin that I just mentioned, which is basically, I mentioned that this is a demand model, right? That is, we know that there's this much demand because we see people paying that money to take those rides today. We know there's that demand. And presumably, if you, I mean, robo taxis have a big advantage. Robo taxis will outcompete human driven taxis and they'll do it really quickly because, for one really simple reason, if you look at the distribution of taxi rides over the course of a day, like say in the Chicago model that I talked about, like I can talk about specific numbers on that one because I did all the math last week and I still remember it all. But it, uh, so it's 10,000, it's a 10,000 vehicle fleet to cover the worst, to, to cover all of the needs. But the thing is you have a two hour window on Friday night where you need 10,000 vehicles. And the rest of the time, you know, 20% of the vehicles in your fleet are idle. Okay, so if you're like, let, we'll talk about the scenario, not the one where where Tesla owns all 10,000 cars, just to have a talking point, right? Okay, so you've got, two, so 90% of the time, 2,000 vehicles are idle. So what do you do with the 2,000 vehicles? You pre-position them, right? Chicago is 230 square miles. Um, so you pre-position, you got 2,000 spare taxis sitting around. You got a taxi within 15 seconds of every single point in Chicago. So somebody gets their phone out, they want a taxi, they got it in 30 seconds, absolutely guaranteed. 24 hours, you know, anytime, the taxi's gonna be there for you. They can also undercut on price. Obviously, you know, if, you're, if, if you've got $2 a mile of profit baked into your business model, you can come down on price. So between the fact that you can provide a really consistent experience because the taxis are always the same, no, they're never in a bad mood, you know, <laughs> you, never, you never get one that smells terrible, you know, it's a super consistent experience. It gets there much faster than the, because yeah. essentially you can't private. afford to pay. And What's it's that? private. It's private. That's, You're the only person yeah, in the like, tech. They're just going to win.